The riots in Japan were originally passed off as a violent communist uprising by both the American and Japanese governments. The reality of the situation, however, was not quite so black and white. While it is true that much of the discontent among the Japanese was due to their conservative government, there were protesters representing every political affiliation present. The bilateral security treaty between Japan and the United States acted as the catalyst that spurred these riots. The terms were so unbalanced that many people took to calling it another unequal treaty reminiscent of the days of imperialization. According to Justin Jesty, the author of our article, quote, the security treaty was criticized across the political spectrum in Japan, but its most profound effect was to deepen and exacerbate the already deep divide between the political left and right, end quote. After the departure of American politicians from the country, the Japanese people were left to fight amongst each other over their political differences, neither side being more notably violent than the other. All sides of the political spectrum were opposed to the treaty, but the radical Japanese conservatives sued anybody who opposed it for reasons other than theirs as radical communists. Ultimately, the conflict between the parties came down to their views on Japan's defense force. Miller is quoted as saying, quote, Mainstream conservatives argued that popular support for pacifist ideals embodied in Article 9 of the 1947 Constitution precluded that anything more than the creation of a modest self-defense force whose only mission was the defense of Japanese home islands in the unlikely event of a direct attack. Even this was too much for the left-wing progressives who, rallying under the slogan of unarmed neutrality, vehemently opposed both the American alliance and the SDF as unconstitutional, end quote. The next three photos were taken on various dates throughout the protest. Each represents a different part of the event. The first explains the discontent among the Japanese people in spite of the American government. Many felt the United States is using their supreme political powers to manipulate the Japanese government into getting involved in their efforts with containment against communism. This idea leads into the next photo depicting the signing of the security treaty in 1951. The third photo is important because it represents the extreme conservative side that was just as violent as the so-called violent communists. This photo helps to explain that each side of the political spectrum was just as passionate about their position on the treaty. It wasn't just the far left side that was acting out. Hamaya Hiroshi took this photo. He was a photographer who normally photographed nature and ethnographic scenes in Japan. The audience intended for this photograph was anybody interested in these 1960s protests. Hiroshi himself was sympathetic towards the people protesting against the Treaty of Mutual Cooperation and Security between the United States and Japan. This image was taken on June 10, 1960, which was right in the middle of protesting. This picture depicts a U.S. Marines helicopter picking up the press secretary of the U.S. President Eisenhower. James Campbell Hegarty, who was to plan the arrival of the U.S. President on June 15th. Protesting prohibited Hegarty from leaving his car to go to the airport, so the U.S. had to send a helicopter in order to safely retrieve the press secretary. This is a primary source photograph from the event. This brings the perspective that the protesters were not only upset with their Japanese government, but also the United States for bilaterally agreeing to what they saw as an unfair treaty. The limitation of this perspective is that the picture just shows a U.S. helicopter flying over the Japanese protest. It doesn't really show the fact that this helicopter was retrieving the press secretary. The caption and background behind this picture is what gives it such importance, instead of this picture itself. The audience for this photograph was the world. It shows the bilateral U.S.-Japan Security Treaty being signed in San Francisco. This picture was taken on the 8th of September, 1951, during the signing of the Security Treaty and after the signing of the Peace Treaty. This was a treaty, and it bound the U.S. and Japan as military allies against communist threats in East Asia. According to Justin Jesty, many, including the Prime Minister, believed that, quote, the Security Treaty was widely regarded as the price that Japan had to pay in order to regain sovereignty. Yoshida Shigeru, the conservative prime minister who negotiated the treaty, understood many of the U.S. demands as non-negotiable. Such was the U.S. military interest in Japan that, had he not agreed to them, the end of the occupation could have been postponed indefinitely. End quote. This image shows the perspective that the bilateral decision to enact this treaty <clears throat> was, was one-sided. It allows the view to see the U.S. presence and the Japanese. Most of the American politicians have a smile on their face and are excited when all of the Japanese politicians are straight-faced. This could just be a cultural difference, but it could also signify a dissonance in feelings towards this specific treaty between the two governments. The limitations of this perspective are that we can only infer the feelings behind this treaty. There are no concrete facts that originate from the photo con uh, concerning the feelings towards the treaty. This photograph was taken by Hamaya Hiroshi on the 26th of May 1960 during the Anpo protests. 
The audience intended was anyone interested in these protests, specifically the extreme right-wing action. This was towards the beginning of the protests that began on May 20th and lasted until June 22nd. It depicts conservative, pro-American protesters scaling a fence to attack left-wing protesters holding signs such as, We Dislike Ike. They were assembled at the Haneda Airport to welcome the delegation led by the White House Press Secretary James Hagerty. This perspective is that of extreme right-wing protesters, which is completely different from most of the pictures from the essay. The limitation of this picture is that it just captures a mere second in time. It doesn't necessarily show the violence that was taking place. This perspective shows us that the protesters against the security treaty were violent. It was seen on both sides of the political spectrum. Ultimately, the protests in Japan in 1960 represented a multitude of issues that were stirring in the country. Internally, the socialists, communists, and constitutional liberals were incredibly worried about the legit legitimacy of the treaty as well as how the treaty was implemented. There were concerns Prime Minister Yishi made a unilateral decision to sign the treaty, which would break the democratic constitution that was established after World War II. Many of these same opposers <clears throat> were also worried that Yishi was creeping close to the past government mentality during World War II. By stimulating the military-industrial complex, this meant that the Article 9 of the constitution that prohibited any form of defense in Japan to be amended or worked around. For example, within the primary source, Declaration of the Peace Problems discussion group on questions surrounding an agreement on peace, found in our... Sources of East Asian Tradition book is quoted as saying, quote, A separate peace treaty or de facto separate peace will involve military cooperation with specific countries or the granting of military bases to specific countries. However one describes such arrangements, they will contradict the preamble in Article 9 of our Constitution. They will further contribute to the destruction of Japan and the world. Under no circumstances can we accept this, end quote. Most citizens of Japan felt helpless and were terrified that there was nothing to be done to stop the violation of their own laws by the United States and the LDP that was in power. The only voice they felt they had was protest. Therefore, the United States occupied Japan, implemented a new constitution that U.S. diplomats created, then, in 1951 and again in 1960, allowed the Japanese government to break its own constitution. The treaty that the U.S. had Japan sign lacked a specific time frame for revision, allowed U.S. troops to quell domestic protests, and did not specifically require the U.S. to intervene if Japan was invaded. All of these things combined, it could be assumed that the United States had not changed in its ways in creating unfair treaties and taking advantage of East Asian countries to benefit their own imperialistic desires. The U.S. became intertwined in East Asian proxy wars and used the domino theory as an explanation, but this does not justify their acceptance in allowing Japan to break its own constitution in order to help the United States to contain communism. In no way was the United States adhering to their democratic rhetoric, nor was it fair for the civilians residing within Japan.